Welcome, everyone. My name is Lucas Lachance. I am the partner of Practice Growth here at Lane Gorman Trubit. Um, I'm excited to welcome you to our first webinar of 2022. This is the first of an eight part series called Aiming Towards Success. Today, we're gonna to be discussing new school business development with Emily Ackerman. Um, as I've mentioned, you know, we're excited to be offering a diverse selection of webinars in 2022. Looking down the list of attendees today, I see a lot of familiar names, which is great, um, but I also see some new folks. And so I wanna take a second and tell you a little bit about the firm. We are a full service accounting firm. We offer everything that you'd expect. So that includes um, any tax services. We have a, an attorney that runs our state and local tax practice, as well as anything federal and also some partners that run our international tax practice. We also have assurance services, so compilations, reviews, and audits. Our ACS group is project-based work, and that includes things like monthly bookkeeping, uh, bookkeeping services, CFO and controller by the hour. Um, and we've recently merged in a new group that allows us to offer things like due diligence, as well as um, turnaround and restructuring for, for companies that are in distress. So um, again, we, we aim to be a one-stop shop for everything financial. Um, with that out of the way, I do wanna turn it over to Emily Ackerman. She is the star of our show this afternoon. So Emily, take it away. Hey there, y'all. A little bit of internet connectivity issues. I'm good now, but hello. My name is Emily Ackerman. So just briefly, we're going to go, I'm going to go over just the table of contents really quick. The first little bit is just, I'll tell you a little bit about me. Then we're going to go over just the basics of networking. And from there, cover why it's important. And I've got some eight steps that I tend to follow and when I go into any kind of networking meeting, whether it's an event or a one-on-one -on -one or just a small group setting, I tend to follow these eight little strategy tips that I laid out and I'll get to cover those with you guys. So first little bit again about me, and I'm gonna bring all of these back to the fold, um, but just wanna give you a little bit of a general overview. I'm born and raised here in Dallas, Fort Worth. I'm a very proud dog mom. These are my babies. Um, the black one is, is Davy. He's nine. And yes, he's three-legged. And the other one who's brown, that is Sully. And he's three, believe it or not. Um, loved being born and raised in Dallas, Fort Worth, but I loved getting out of state for my undergrad. And I went to American University in Washington, D.C. Woohoo, go Eagles. Um, from there, and just whenever I have a free moment, I love to travel. Um, one thing that was one of my favorite parts about college was studying abroad. And I studied in Rome, Italy, and I ate all the pasta all the things. Um, but even on my honeymoon, got to go over all over Asia right before the COVID. And so enjoy traveling whenever I can. Um, sports that I like to play. I've always grown up playing tennis and in middle school, I started boxing and that's been a real fun thing for me. It's a great way to relieve stress, by the way. But when I'm not working or with family and friends, you can always find me talking about music. And back in the day, I used to be in grunge rock and roll cover bands. And if you wanna actually hear me sing, um, message me for that. But needless to say, I wanted to bring that up because I'll keep coming back to these little hobbies and interests and little things about me. And you'll figure out why in a little bit. But wanna to get to the bottom of this. What is networking? This is why we're here. When you really do break down what networking is, you really are doesn't matter who you are, what age, walk of life, your career, you name it. You walk into the room knowing that everyone in the room has equal value and you'll learn something from everyone you meet. You never know what a conversation will lead to. And the goal is to make connections for life and enjoying people for who they are when they're actually not working. To me, it's very much if you're meeting with a lender, there's hundreds of banks. If you're a CNI lender, you mostly are all working on the same kind of things. We all want business owners that are nice, that pay on time. So beyond what you do for your job, get to actually know people for who they are. You might figure out that one person was born in New York City, that they're a cat person, um, that they have a funny, embarrassing tattoo on their back. That's what you want to know and learn about people and just enjoying them for who they are. It's also about listening. I think a lot of people tend to just Talk, 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 and don't actually listen. Sit and actually intentionally try to learn more I and mean, figure out ways to help them. And that's all through just sitting back and listening to people talk and connecting the dots. And kind of like dating, 
the goal is to build genuine relationships with people that you want to continue to hang out with them and get to know them throughout their career, whether they're a young associate at a law firm or a partner at another firm. You just never know what you're going to, what will lead from a conversation when you meet someone new. But networking is great at any point in your career, whether you're starting off or whether you're super experienced. People rely on other people and it you can't do anything by yourself. It takes a village and it starts with networking. And so why is it important? There's a bunch of reasons, but I'm going to break down these in particular because these are what I go into every meeting thinking with anyone that I meet. So the reason it's important is one, it's an avenue to exchange ideas, it makes you noticeable, or in my words, famous. It's an avenue for newer opportunities. It's a great way to reassess your qualification at your current point in time in your career. It also improves your intellect. It's also a great way to get support from other high profile individuals in the community. It's a great way also to build that little bit of an ego, but your self-esteem and your self-confidence. And the end goal, which is the most important to me of them all, is to develop those long-term relationships. So let's get to the breakdown of it. Emily, before you hop in on the, the different reasons, um, one thing I wanted to bring up, I, I think, and I, I hope that you'd agree, often when people enter into a networking situation, the, the first thing they think about is closing a deal as opposed to relationship building. I, I, I feel like that's often kind of a, a rookie mistake. Wouldn't you agree? 100%. Absolutely 100%. Because look, the way that even like what we do for what we do in the CPA world, let's face it, almost every full service firm, Dallas, the United States and the world, we all do the same things. We all do tax, we all do audit and assurance, and then the other encompassing accounting services in between. So a lot of people go into a meeting with me knowing exactly what an accounting firm does. And if they have no idea what that what I do, I'm happy to explain further. But beyond that little five minute window of here's what we do and the industries we serve and a target customer, you need to learn about other things that are actually memorable and what make that person unique. Um, deals come and go, but those embarrassing moments when you're out and about with someone, um, the memories you made when you went to a baseball game. Um, if one person you meet has that bratty little kid, eight, 10 years from now, you want to follow up, but how's that bratty kid? Um, People don't remember the tax return that we did for them three years ago, but they remember how we made them feel and the little things that we did. And, and that all comes from developing relationships. And sure. so you can tell when someone is what I call WIIFM, what's in it for me, like a radio station. And you can tell when someone is only looking out for their best interest and they're needing to meet a quota and they're getting pressure to go out versus someone who genuinely wants to meet with you and learn about you. And learn from you. I think that's a great distinction. Absolutely. And so kind of hitting on that nail, that first step in why networking is important is it is truly an avenue to exchange ideas. And it all really does boil down to you don't know what you don't know. And you can learn a lot just by sitting back and listening. Um, one thing that I love to do when I'm out and about is every now and then, I'll meet with another CPA firm because we get work when we're conflicted out. But when I'm talking to another person that works in another firm, maybe they're bringing up an event idea that they're going to be running. And I think something like that would actually be interesting to bring to our firm. Maybe it's the fact that they rented out, I'm making it up, an ax throwing event with all their new hires and new interns. Maybe that's something where, oh, I didn't even think about that for some of our young professional people. How fun would that be? But you might even learn a whole new way to prospect and drum up business because when you're meeting another person, it really does foster a trade of ideas and you gain a lot of knowledge from stuff that you, you might not be thinking of. That's kind of why brainstorming sessions at any company you work at are super important because other people are bringing new ideas and new outlooks to the fold. And so when you get these ideas, it's not just helping the place that you work it's also just instilling best practices in your career. One person was telling me many, many years ago um, when I was out and about meeting them that 
instead of doing cold calls, they just do what is called drops, where they'll just actually drop in and go try to meet with the business owner, whether that's bringing them wine, cookies, you name it. Um, instead of doing what everyone else likes to do, I took that and said, you know what? I'm going to put my own little spin on it, but I never thought of doing that. I never thought a business owner would actually want to take the time to meet with me to have beers on a 4 p.m. after the Super Bowl. Not the day of the Super Bowl, but you know what I mean, the next day when their team lost. But regardless, I would have never thought that, oh, that might be a different angle to go get new business because someone told me, you're actually going to meet with that person. It's a better use of your time than picking up the phone. And so had I not met with this person a couple of years ago, I never would have thought in a million years, do a drop. But people will meet with you if you have a six pack of beer. <laughs> Off to reason number two, which is networking makes you noticeable. And again, I'm gonna keep calling it famous, but people, want to do business with someone, not just because of the place that they work, but because they remember you and they have you top of mind. Um, I strive to be everyone in DFW and the uh, aiming for the country, but the DFW Metroplex, whenever anyone has an accounting need, I want them to think of me. I want them to think of you, Lucas. I want them to think of LGT. And being famous, whether that is just from having a really good online presence or really focusing your energy at the organizations and community involvement in ways you are involved in the community, you need to be out there and be famous. And don't be shy about what you're doing in the community. Um, people think and notice other people that are more, not necessarily talked about in the Metroplex, but name recognition is huge. Um, the other thing too, is when you stand out for you as a person versus just the company, it creates more room for partnerships. So because people know my name or your name, Lucas, they'll think of our firm in good light and just going forward. Um, the name Lane Gorman Trubit is a mouthful, but if my name and Lucas's name are easy to remember, that, that's the goal when you're out and about in these streets. Um, we're gonna hit on social media quite a bit throughout this presentation, but one easy way to be noticeable is just through your online presence. Um, because you can't see everyone all day, every day. Let your followers know what you're doing. Um, and I'll keep getting back to the LinkedIn and social media world in a little bit, but don't be shy about your involvement, what you do for work and cool things you're going to and doing in the community. Oops, reason number three, it's an avenue for newer opportunities. And what I mean by that is your network is your net worth. If I had not actually networked with you, Lucas, <laughs> I don't know if I would have been here today because it really does open up the door for new opportunities. And in the beginning of any business development or sales career, or even just any kind of career, you need to grind and get out there and be constantly busy, busy, busy. You finally, after years of putting in that work and time, really hone in on who you like to work with the most within that ecosystem. And it's the phrase, make new friends, but keep the old. Um, so when it came to knowing other CPA people in the Metroplex, just from a conflicted out standpoint, you were my favorite in DFW. <laughs> I had to meet a bunch of people that do exactly what we do in other firms. And you really never know when that connection is going to come in handy. It could be that I'm making it up. Say you work at a bank now and your partner gets transferred to Nashville, Tennessee. You never know if someone you meet because they have to do a job transfer. You never know who knows who in Nashville. And it's all about your network. It's a lot harder to just apply randomly online and send your resume amongst thousands versus picking up the phone with someone you know that's either went to school in Nashville and might have connections, have lived there or currently live there. Um, again, you never know when a conversation will come in handy. But if, again, if I hadn't known you <laughs> through networking, who knows? Well, it's, I, I have said it before and I'll say it again. I, um, <laughs> I got tired of going up against you. And so I figured the easiest way to get, the easiest way to do this was just to bring you on board. 
Um, I get what you mean about the grind though. Um, when I, prior to my current role, I spent about 10 years as an auditor, which was a very different focus for me. I spent a lot of time working with clients, of course, but it was, the focus was on getting the work done, um, working with clients, being very involved in the accounting piece of it. Um, and so when I switched to this role in practice growth, uh, especially when I first started out, I, I took every meeting, every time, everywhere, because I had to, I had to hit the ground running and start by curating and developing my own network. But like you said, over time, you, you whittle that down and it, you hone in on the, on the folks that you really enjoy spending time with. Um, and I think that that's really, that's what makes the critical piece of your network so important. Absolutely. And when we go over to reason number four, networking also does help you reassess where you are in your own career today and your qualifications that you're bringing to your own company right now. Because you might think that your current level of discipline might be the greatest height that you could ever be. So in the accounting world, every firm's a little different, but at our firm, you come in as a staff and the ultimate creme de la creme, la creme, la creme promotion is that equity partner number or that title. And so if you, if you are networking out and about in the community, one thing that is super helpful is being able to utilize, is being able to admi it's, admire other people that are at a different height of their career than you and nourishing those relationships. And it's kind of insider trading of like, how do you do it? How did you get there? What did it take? What did you learn from doing this? Are there any strategies or advice or guidance that you can give me? Because when you're admiring the different roadmaps to success, it can only be reached if you have a strong network of people. So in my situation, coming in as director of business development, my end goal, my end titles, I want to be the queen. I want partner. I think that would be just fantastic. And that's my long-term goal. But I... I can't get there without a network of people that think of me from business opportunities. Well, and when you and I, you and I work together a lot um, through the process of crafting what this position for you would look like. Um, and so I think your point here about reassessing your qualifications, I, even before you and I entered into those initial conversations, I had other conversations with folks within my own network who are also business developers to rough out a framework of what this director position should be. And we went out, the, the partners here at our at the firm went into it with an idea of we, we want a certain level of talent. So then we know that that comes with a specific price tag and it comes with the right kind of commission structure. And we're gonna talk about some of that stuff in a little bit, but um, you know, it was very much polling the network and finding out from just our peers what, the market would support and then crafting a position that would be a win-win both for you and I and the firm. So we, I think it's important to one, the other part of this too, is you have to know your worth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're, you always are going to have to be your own best advocate. And if you know what the market will bear, it puts you in a better position to have those conversations for the next line, the next promotion, the next step up, the next move for your career. Absolutely. And going on just for the sake of time to reason number five, which is it improves your intellect. And this kind of also boils down to, and I'm going to give the example of the accounting world. So it's helpful to learn from others that do similar work in a completely different industry. And I give the example below for estate planning lawyers and tax partners because they're like-minded people, they're able to share ideas about what's going on in the marketplace. Are these tax laws changing, um, gains, you name it. It's good to know people that are in complementary career paths because it helps you grow in your own career because you can send each other business, but it also can help being more creative with your approach for your clients as well. Having said that, with the estate planning lawyers and tax partners, they go hand in hand because there's an estate planning component that goes with tax planning and not only just making you rich, but keeping you rich. But say when you're out there as a tax person and you're meeting other estate planning lawyers in the community, they all have different approaches of what is the best for your own personal worth. But you never know when a simple interaction with one person can transform 
years worth of research and like your own digging, someone is going to have that brilliant idea that you didn't think of. Um, and it's good to find those complementary people. In the accounting world, we are blessed and cursed with the fact that every single person could be a client because mm-hmm. every single person has tax returns. Having said that, if you have an industry focus, say you're more focused on construction, then I would network with anyone that touches construction business owners in North Texas because you never know what you will learn from anyone that has also has a fo- that also has a focus on that particular industry as you. Right. Next up, you get the support from the high profile people. So one thing that is important to remember in networking, it doesn't matter if you're new in your career, you've been there for three to five years. It doesn't matter if you're a senior, those senior level people and in our case partners, they've been in your shoes before. They have tales from the crypt. They know (laughs) they've been there before and they're not all that far removed, but networking actually does give you a reason to get in front of people that you might not normally have been able to get in front of. And a lot of this comes from networking events. Uh, For example, I actually am almost positive that one of the Um, market presidents is on this call, but one organization that I love to be involved with in the community is called ACG. And they're active all over the country. But in Dallas, one of the best parts about ACG and just one of those events is they have programming all throughout the day. And one of my favorite events that they do is their dealmaker series. What's nice about that is it's not assigned seating when it's time to eat the meal, whether it's breakfast or lunch. You really are sitting at a table next to anyone and everyone. You never know if you're going to sit next to the managing partner of a law firm. You never know if you're going to sit next to someone who runs the family office. You never know if you're going to meet the the market president of a bank. But again, I'm 32. I've been doing business development for 10 years, but I don't think a managing partner of a law firm would take my email or solicitation as easily as it would be had I not sat next to them. And it's through networking. Um, It's not every day that you sit next to someone who's just going to give you a multi-billion dollar deal just from standing in line at a Starbucks. But you have access to people that are beyond where you are in your career through networking. And don't be shy about asking them about sage advice and guidance. Again, they've been there. It's also fun to me to get people talking about just their career journey, bringing it back to listening intentionally, you can learn so much from people that are 20 years more experienced than you. And you can also learn from someone who's brand new. Again, I'm 32. I've been doing business development for 10 years. And the way people are doing business development that are in their early twenties could not be more different than me, but I'm learning from them. Um, I feel old (laughs) when I'm learning about all these different platforms out there and abbreviations, but whenever I meet someone that's 10, 15, 20 years senior for me, I really just kind of have the whole meeting be, tell me all about your life and how you did it. I want to hear everything. And it's not about the deal. It's, I want to hear your story. Yeah. Uh, You mentioned, um, you mentioned ACG. Are you, are we going to touch on um, different types of organizations or, or membership later on? Yep. Okay, good. Then we'll, I'll, I'll save my question for then. You got it. Reason number seven, status and self-confidence, baby. <laughs> my mom told me this, and y'all can read the text and just get that kind of general overview, but I grew up in a household where, believe it or not, even though I'm in a business development role, as a little kid, I was pretty shy. And my mom used to always tell me, fake it till you make it. No one likes a wet blanket. So when you go into a crowded room or you meet someone, Smile, even if it's not real, fake it. People are drawn to confidence and people that are experienced in networking can smell when you're nervous. I'm not talking odor, but like you can, it's just so obvious it's in the air. Um, It not only just builds self-esteem and confidence, but if you walk out of a meeting and it was a really effective meeting, you feel really good. And I use this example all the time networking and sales, it's just like dating. Have you ever left a first date and you're thinking, I knocked that one out of the part. They're in love with me. I know it. I've also left some where I'm thinking, I absolutely bombed that. That was a terrible (laughs) use of my time and energy. But 
I also use networking as a way to kind of practice interview skills as well. Um, I've been asked some pretty tricky questions. I've been asked some questions that catch me off guard, but I love those questions because it makes me better and quicker on my feet. Um, again, life's too short to work with people you don't like, and you never know where that conversation will lead. And it all starts with that first one, just like dating, you can find commonalities between everyone. You can't fake chemistry. And a lot of that does come from confidence. Again, if you're faking it or not, people are drawn towards that energy. You seem interesting and eager to, to learn more about people, but just like a bad date where you have literally nothing in common and someone just doesn't seem prepared or interested in talking, you, you leave that meeting thinking, what did, that's weird. I usually do very well at these, but self-esteem and self-confidence and networking just comes through practice. And another bit about that too is there's a few there's a few different approaches that you can go for networking events. Some people prefer just doing one on ones. They feel that they can shine better that way, and they get kind of intimidated in, in large crowds. There are other people that actually really love the big crowded events. I know some people that are like myself that are actually just much better at networking events in the mornings, lunch, and afternoons because I wake up so early to work out. There are some people that are more nighttime owls. They want to go to that late night dinner, happy hour. There's hundreds of different options of how you can network and utilize your time, but through practice and smiling, even if you don't want to, it's going to build your self-esteem. And reason number eight, which is the most important is developing long-term relationships. Again, sales is just like dating. You ultimately want to lead and have your end game be you find someone that is just as crazy and wild as you, that's similar to you, but that all comes, you don't ask someone to marry you on the first date. Just like you don't ask someone that you're networking with to only work exclusively with me on right. deals. That's a huge turnoff. Um, you also, if you really like someone that you meet, you want to continue to hang out with them. It takes two to tango. Um, say you left a great meeting after an event and you met someone that you really liked, follow up with them. You can't, it, the modern whole way of just how people have to make new friends, especially during COVID, whether it was a, a Zoom webinar event, sort of like this, whether it was a speed dating breakfast at a chamber, whether it was a massive convention or you were invited to a fun little dinner outing, you, you can tell based on a first impression if you liked someone. And a lot of that does come from uncovering common interest. In my example, if I meet anyone that I'm networking with and they say that they have a large dog or something like a Rhodesian Ridgeback, I always loop back to my dogs, Davy and Sully. If someone studied abroad, whether it be Florence or Rome, hey, I've got that in common with you. If you bring up to me that you love classic rock and grunge and metal music, I will not be shy about my love of that stuff. And that will immediately make me think of you and want to go to concerts with you later on. But it all boils down to life is just too short to work with people you don't like. And right. you want to do business with people you enjoy spending time with. So similar to dating, and I have, I have been out of the dating circulation for quite some time, but similar to dating, when and how should you follow up? I How, how quickly? I am the type where with cell phones, no more than three feet away from us at all times. My rule of thumb is you have no excuse. You need to respond in the next 24 hours. Whether that's a text message, an email, a handwritten letter, something. Okay. Even as simple as really enjoyed meeting you and getting to know you. I hope we can do this again soon. Okay. There's no excuse. Um, if you like someone, it's just like dating this whole, like, oh, I'm going to wait for them to call me. No, be proactive. <laughs> Pick up the phone. Text. It, I, again, it's one of those where whether it's a prospect, an existing client, or just networking and you meet someone neat, do what others don't ex are not having, which is follow up and follow through and don't be that clinger, but 
<laughs> even just that acknowledgement of, I really enjoyed meeting you. That's yeah. it. It takes two seconds. Okay. And so we covered just the reasons why networking is important. And here's kind of my roadmap and my eight steps to how to network the right way. And we, I kind of highlighted and touched on a bunch of these, but we're going to go through one by one. So the first one is start networking before you need it. And it's so funny because I wish someone told this to me when I first started in my business development career. At my first experience with business development, I worked for CBS Radio. I was in media and marketing. No one told me, oh, you don't have to cold call or send hundreds of emails a day. Actually go meet people in person. It might take a little bit more time in the beginning, but you'll actually get a lot more referrals and business will actually come to you more quickly. No one told me this. I had to figure this out and learn that people want to do business they enjoy spending time with. And again, seasoned people in the profession can tell that you're desperate. And it's very much a what's in it for me mentality. We can smell it from far, far away. And the best part about getting started early on, again, you don't have to go to every event. You don't have to be involved in every organization. What I try asking anyone that I meet with within my own company or at LGT, when I'm getting to know an employee is, what do you like to do when you're not working? Because if you're not with your coworkers, you're then with your family and friends. We do not have that many hours left in the week. So when you are having that free little moment or that couple hours a week to network, what do you want to, what do you like to do in and who do you like to be around? And are there specific things in the community that interest you? Um, and it does not matter if you are a first year, mid-level or partner, everyone has to network. And it does in the beginning, you might have to put in a little bit more effort because you're new. People don't know your name in the community. You haven't been around in the business world long enough. I think, I believe that in networking, it takes about two years at any job, at any role you're at to get people to be comfortable enough with who you are in that role, trust you and the brand that you work for. And these things right. take time, but just because you're at the top of the top does not mean that you have to stop. It's very much a coming back to, again, make new friends, but keep the old, but you can tell when someone is only looking out for themselves in the beginning and desperate to bringing in business. We all want to be billionaires. <laughs> we all do. And these things take time. And I, I think too, a specific to at least our, the accounting profession that we're in, the, the transaction cycle and the, and the deal cycle is, is pretty lengthy. Um, mm -hmm. From the time that you first meet somebody that, um, that may be a prospect or, you know, or is you're just even at this point, introducing yourself and, and like you said, brand awareness, which you're doing a lot of right now, having recently switched companies, you know, your, your network knows Emily, but now you're spent taking your time introducing them to LGT as well. Correct. But um, that, that deal cycle is, I often think nine months or longer, particularly for things like taxes, audits, um, you know, services that only show up once a year. Um, you know, that doesn't get on a business owner's radar until a several, a couple months before that's actually needed. So uh -huh. that sales cycle, nine months, that's nothing. And it, oh. and it can often be longer. Totally. So, um, so things like cold calling, I, I think it has its place. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but just one sec. Um, I think cold calling has its place in different industries where the sales cycle is much faster. Totally. And I agree with you. At the same time, I have a rule of thumb where it's treat others how you would like to be treated. And I don't answer any unknown number unless you leave a voicemail. And I know you're real because <laughs> Sam Risk likes to call me every day. She's my new best friend. But yeah. again, start early and start often. If you like smaller networking or larger group events, start somewhere. And it does not matter what level you are in your career. Agreed. Next up for just my other step is have a plan. And we know every single person has value that you, we meet with. It does not, you might not recognize that offhand or in the beginning if someone introduces you to someone in the community. But what I like 
doing before I go to a networking event is mapping out a plan in my mind. I'm not going to write down a whole like to do list, but say, because I'm at an accounting firm and I'm bringing up the estate, law, estate planning lawyer thing again. So I try mapping out what I want to talk about in advance about the firm. I hone in on our estate planning services that we help with for our, our tax clients. I talk about just the kind of clients that we have. If since they're in a similar space that we're in, could I make introductions to people in similar worlds that also have to do with the estate planning side of things, be it a wealth advisor, insurance, you never know. But I go in kind of with a game plan um, about how I can initially help them already, because you can't gauge a person's personality so much online or hobbies and interests. All I know is that what they do for work. So when people think of a CPA firm, they think lenders for audits. They think payroll. They think insurance and employee benefits. They think wealth advisors. They think lawyers. They think everything. And so go in with a little bit of a game plan and that back of your mind Rolodex of here's a few people that I think I should introduce you to. Next up, forget your personal agenda. Lucas, you just kind of highlighted it. In our world, in the accounting world, sales takes forever. I still have prospects from my past life that I still want to be a client today. And it's been many years. And the goal is to forge connections with people who may be able to help each other. I joke with people like, People do not wake up in the morning feeling like switching CPA firms. It just does <laughs> not happen. It really does take, I'm going to get a little morbid, a death, retiring, moving away, or a really big screw up. Because right. deadlines are deadlines. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If a company really likes their existing accounting firm, why would you shake that up? Right. Now, having said that, because people don't wake up feeling like switching CPA firms because I'm networking and because I network, people keep me top of mind when they know something in real time. For example, if, if there's a CPA at another accounting firm that's retiring, sometimes a company or a business owner doesn't necessarily want a new relationship or that loyalty to that existing firm is not there anymore. <laughs> and so it's all about knowing people that touch the same business owner or prospective client as you. So if I was working in media and advertising, I would want to network with people in the community that network with media agencies and marketing managers and CMOs and local businesses in the community. If I was working in payroll, I would want to know all the CPA firms out there because they're dealing with clients that might not actually have good payroll in place. Um, the other thing and the best little networking tip I can give you is a phrase that I say all the time, which is I'm, if I can't bring you a genuine lead or a prospective client, the least I'll do is get you in front of people that you need to know. And like that last bullet point says is generosity is an attractive quality. And it's something special that people will remember about you. They'll remember that you are a giver, that it's not about yourself or your best interest. And good things come back to you if you do good in the community. And so it could be as simple as if I know someone in business that went to American University and I'm networking with someone that might have been to Georgetown down the street, just for the sake of you have DC in common, <laughs> I'm going to make the introduction, especially if I know you'll get along. If I know someone also studied abroad in Rome, that I meet with in business, it's like, oh, you should definitely talk to so-and-so. It's, it's not thinking about yourself so much and just thinking about bettering your own business world. One of the things I, um, I love, I looked at your LinkedIn profile um, because it's basically a masterclass in <laughs> how to set up a good LinkedIn profile. But one of the things that hit home to me is one of the taglines on your LinkedIn profile is that you're a connector. And I connect, you connect CFOs and CEOs to other people that need those types, need, need assistance in some way. And it, it comes back to what you're talking about here, which is that um, the generosity piece. I, I, you know, you may not be, you may not be looking for a new CPA firm right now, but 
you have some other need. And if I can be in, in some way, if I can assist you in that, I can help fill that need for you, that that will come back to you. Absolutely. Being useful to somebody. Absolutely. And this is also going on to point number four, which is never think anyone is unimportant. Um, I have actually was just having this conversation with a friend of mine who's a wealth advisor in the community, and she's with a more small, a smaller shop. But one thing that we were talking about is it's so funny that some of the larger companies don't talk to people when they're younger in their career, the ones that have been marked as just having really good potential. Um, make it, it make it your mission, whether you see the potential in someone long term or you see someone's value, no one is unimportant. And ask questions about people genuinely. If you're having a really good meeting and just everything business lines up, I like to ask like, what kind of special education or other like books are you reading that will enhance, that enhance your career? Are you reading anything cool? Um, what makes you tick? Um, what are the issues going on in your industry that are keeping you up at night? The little things. Um, you never know if someone right now is an associate at a law firm and they're going to be the managing partner of a massive global firm in a few years. You never know if someone that you work with in an accounting firm is eventually going to, who knows, be the CFO of a major company. If you treat people with kindness, they will remember that throughout their entire career and they will think of you and keep you in mind. Um, the other thing also is someone you meet, ah, sorry, technical difficulties. Someone might be where they are now in their career. But again, if you see that potential long-term and you were nice to them, you have no idea how much it'll pay off in the long run when they are eventually a decision maker. And now avoiding the te technical difficulties, <laughs> get to connect the dots. Um, since every person has value, it's essential that you know what yours is. And so kind of how you honed in on my LinkedIn profile where I'm a connector. Yeah. One time in an interview a long, long, long time ago, someone said, what are you excellent at? And at that point of being like 21 in college, I had no <laughs> idea. I said, I don't know. I'm really good at a lot of different things. But when, as I've developed in my career, I have learned that one thing I am good at is connecting strangers that need to meet, making other people very rich by my introductions. And so the thing that I would stress with anyone is map out what you want to talk about in these meetings with people, particular how you may be able to help other people either now or in the future, because your goal is whenever, I'm going to make this up, say, say I meet a wealth advisor that went to Baylor University. If I meet someone, say, an estate planning lawyer that also went to Baylor, I'm going to connect that dot right there because I, I remembered Baylor. Um, if I meet a potential prospect that is really heavy into cryptocurrency and loves talking about Ethereum to the moon, whenever I meet anyone that is a expert in that space, I'm going to connect them. It's right. mapping it out ahead of time. Then on to number six, which is figure out how you can be useful because one thing that people forget about is, especially when you're meeting with someone who's much more experienced than you is what can they gather or learn from me? I'm just a small peabody in the grand scheme of things, but once you begin to listen to people and learn what they can bring to the table and you in turn, you'll start realizing how one person in the room may be able to help or how you might be able to help one another. And so one thing that is funny for me is I'll be introduced to people that are much more senior than me, but where they like to learn from me is you're all over the internet. How do you do what you're doing? <laughs> hey, you, it, it, for me, it's as simple as just saying, I just, I write a lot of things in advance and I hit copy paste, <laughs> but, but no, I mean, you really, again, if you go out of the way to make these really promising connections, you're doing your part in making the networking event a success. Even if that means you are passing on little tips and tricks about, Hey, there's this company called Clearview Social. They'll do all the posting for you. Or, Hey, if you do it a couple of days in advance, all the hard work is done. If you have a hard time getting creative, but 
Lucas, I don't know if you have any points on this, but it, this is <laughs> one of those where everyone can learn something from someone, whether it is, I mean, it could be as silly as if I want to find out what makes someone's hair look so good and less frizzy. I want to learn how to make my hair less frizzy. If someone's lost a lot of weight, I want to know your secrets. Oh, I want to know those secrets too. Um, actually, this this point in particular hits hits home for me as part with especially with the learning from from other folks. Um, I in in practice growth, as you know, we are surrounded by tremendous talent. the The team here, they're all very strong, very good, capable, um, forward thinking marketers, which is great because my background is not marketing. So I learn every day from, you know, and, and half of our team are young enough, absolutely young enough to be my, my children. Um, but I learn every single day, different things about how to be better at marketing, how to be better at business development, how to increase my reach, because, um, they're, they're, you know, certainly they're more technologically advanced than I am. And, and, and they keep me current on what's, on what's developing in the industry. And I, I, I appreciate that. So it isn't necessarily just that you have gray hair that all of a sudden you know it all. Yeah. I mean, I learn, I learn every day and I, I'm surrounded, you know, when you, you see the team, I'm surrounded by brilliant, brilliant folks. So, uh, you know, there is absolutely something to be, to be learned from everyone. Absolutely. And just for the sake of time, number seven. Okay. Uh, ah, here we go. Be that resource that they think of. And again, this all plugs out <coughs> and goes back to being famous and being top of mind. Um, I always, and I've heard a lot of people recently when I'm out networking with them say this, but you can finish your whole opportunity by saying, if you need anything, please feel free to reach out to me or connect with me on LinkedIn. Another one is if you want to even just sign up for our e-newsletter to keep up in real time with what's going on, please do that. Um, we offer, and we're so fortunate again to offer a service that every single person needs. So when you are top of mind and you've branded yourself through networking with like-minded people in the community, you will be who they think of, whether it's through marketing on your own social media and your online presence, whether it is being a board president, whether it's being at every chamber breakfast for the Plano chamber people will think of you because of your networking and just really own the fact that you're a resource for everyone. And you know, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. You. Okay. Uh, well, one of the questions that came through the chat, I think is kind of relevant here. Um, and that is that um, the question itself was, how do you, how do you network if you're an introvert? I think this piece in particular speaks to that in that, you don't, don't necessarily have to approach it with, I have to go and sell something, which for introverts is a horrifying prospect. But instead, I can be a resource, which means I, um, I could serve on a board mm -hmm. of an organization and I can add value that way, yep. but it's in a, it's in a, a much more controlled environment. Yep. Um, or simply, I, I had an opportunity to meet you. And then later on, I came across this article that reminded me of the conversation that you and I had. Exactly. And, and I want to forward that article to you. And, you know, when, what it does is the several, accomplishes several of the things you're talking about. It keeps you top of mind, but it's also very non-threatening. Um, I, you know, I am sending something to you because you were on my mind and I remembered a conversation that we had and I thought this would be valuable. Um, yeah. And so you're accomplishing being the resource that they can rely on, but you're doing it in a way that is still within your comfort zone if you don't have that big, bold personality. Absolutely. And to even take another step further, at my last firm, I was meeting with someone and they were scared of their own shadow. But when I was really figuring out, like, what do you like to do when you're not working? They truly had no hobbies except for one thing, running. There's someone that actually likes to run marathons and these half marathons and 10 Ks, you could never pay me enough to do that. But one way that I suggested she get out there and network is they have running social clubs that oh, are yeah. they're with people that are equally as crazy that enjoy jogging 15 miles because they feel like it. So you have, like you said, it's more comfortable. Your guard is down because heck, if you want to talk running the whole time, you're with a bunch of other people that want to run as far as you for fun. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, 
you know, I just, I hope that people who run marathons know that they don't have to, like, that's not a requirement. Like no one's making you. Um, there's a really good point that came up in the chat too from Amor. She said um, that being an introvert also makes you more of a listener rather than a talker. And yeah. I, listening is an absolutely underrated and critical skill in networking. You can't be thinking about what am I going to say next? You have to be focused on the person in front of you engaged in that conversation in real time. Absolutely. Um, so I, I think Amor's point is really great. It, it, um, as an introvert, you are particularly attuned to being a listener. Mm hmm. And not only not only that, just from being a good listener is introverts tend to also be better one on one. They're more comfortable in smaller group environments. And even the most experienced networkers in the world, some people just don't like super large crowded events. They feel really lost and they're overwhelmed. One on one networking for coffee is way less intimidating. <laughs> You're yes. It's, it's very much, it's, you don't have to worry about what you're saying and handing out your cards and all that. It's very much a, just tell me about yourself. You yeah. live nearby. Um, yeah. Why, why'd you join the company you joined? Um, you name it, but just for the sake of time, I'm gonna go to slide eight. We talked about this and you asked this question earlier. Yep. Follow up and follow through. Again, every single person is busy. We all have jobs, we have families, we have crazy spouses crazy dogs, children, you name it. But it, people, I think, put way too much stress on themselves about following up with people. And it really does boil down to treat people how you want to be treated. Do you not feel so flattered and happy when you receive a thank you card? If That's someone sad. just randomly was texted me and said, I was just thinking about you. I saw St. Bernard on a walk and I <laughs> thought of you. And also if someone is on a trip and sends a, like an email with a check out these cool views, like when you're thought of and feel appreciated, it is the best feeling in the world. And those little things set you apart. And in the accounting world where we have so many competitors and we could lose a client based on customer service and not being attentive enough, it is in our best interest, again, the busiest people in the world still respond to emails. They still return your calls. And as I tell people, if you literally have no time in the day, and I'm talking not even when you're done eating dinner and you're in your pajamas, stoplights, restrooms, you can find <laughs> one to three minutes of your day to respond to someone, even if you're on the dome or in your car. Um, it doesn't... If you show up a few minutes early to a meeting or if someone gets up to go to the restroom while you're in your meeting, you have two minutes right there. And so be that bridge. And also just because someone isn't reaching out to you right away doesn't mean that you can't reach out to them. If you're thinking right. about them, call them. And there's none of these like dating games of, oh, I'm going to wait three days before I respond. No, if you think <laughs> of someone and you have something to say, follow up and follow through. Love it. I absolutely love it. We, um, we're coming up towards the end of our two, our hour long today. Um, I do want to talk, we had a question or two come in through um, the chat about some compensation guidelines. And you and I spent a lot of time talking about um, the right kind of compensation model. Um, and we, you can, there are lots of different ways, depending on the industry that you're in, whether I can go where it can be 100% salary, it can be mm -hmm. commission only, um, it can be a blend, which I think certainly in the accounting world is probably the best way to go where there's, there's a salary component and then a, um, a commissioner and additional variable compensation on the back end of it. Um, you've had the benefit now of working for several companies that um, have had different compensation models. I know mm -hmm. In media, um, it is very heavily commission-based, mm. um, but the sales cycle is also very different in media than it is, um, yeah. for example, in, in our world and, and accounting right now. So um, what has, I want to open up just to get some of your thoughts on what you think some of those compensation models, you know, which has worked better? Um, and what are some of the things that you think are important to build into a good compensation model? Absolutely. So in my, in my world, um, I'm plagued with anxiety. Sales has so many peaks and valleys that for yes. me, and I've learned this through other approaches where some companies, like you're saying, have no base in your 100% commission. You eat what you kill. And there are some where you have 
a smaller base, but much larger commission. And I've also seen it where you have a much higher base and smaller commission. Again, everyone is very different. Um, I generally work better with a higher base and smaller commission. And that's because I'd rather know guaranteed what I'm getting paid each month at a minimum. I know that I'm not going to go hungry. Bills will get paid and I'll be able to feed myself and my dogs just fine. Um, right. But there are some people that really live for that chase. Um, for example, if you're in real estate, one big thing that you learn right away is you are 100% commission. There's no, here's a nice base to keep you afloat. If they did that, every single person would be in real estate. But <laughs> it's it's kind of all boiling down to risk versus reward. I would rather be safer and have less commission, but also have that win and thrill of getting a deal done. But I also can keep more of a financial idea of mine of what I'm making. Now, I think it also will depend on where you are in terms of experience of your role. I think Agreed. once you have a lot more seniority and that established network that you've made through networking in the community, you might actually be better off on just commission because a lot of these things become more auto renewal yeah, and just yeah. maintaining relationships. Whereas in the beginning, I think some people would prefer having a bigger base or a base to begin with just to stay afloat and right. pay the bills. Well, I, I think good points, all of them. Um, I also think one thing you have to consider is the length of the sales cycle. Um, you know, I, in situations where there's a lengthy sales cycle or it's something that's highly specialized, highly technical, it makes more sense to have a bigger base and then a commission, um, a commission structure that is um, still variable, but not such a significant component because you could be working on a deal for months or you know years before something actually becomes a new client. Um, and so you need something to sustain you throughout the process. Um, I liked your point about real estate though. Um, my husband for years was um, a real estate agent and it it is touch and go sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. but boy, when the commission check comes in, it's fantastic. Oh, it's fantastic. But... <laughs> you might you might have only one deal though. Um, right. And in right. the accounting world, um, I think one thing that's really attractive about this industry and COVID has really proven this is we are essential. Um, yes. You don't have to necessarily worry so much during the downturn, but times of crisis are opportunity for us. And so. That's true. That's true. Uh, one last piece about the commissions, and then I'm going to kick it back to you for final thoughts um, about the, the compensation structure. Um, we are a relationship firm. Um, it's incredibly expensive and cumbersome for clients to change accounting firms. Um, and so when we want, uh, when we bring clients on board, we want them to stick for a long period of time. Um, as a result, we, in, we, incent the, um, we incent commissions um, based on longevity too. So there's a trailing component, which I think is something that's important um, in specifically in our industry from business development standpoint, um, we want a client that stays with us and the long, you know, as they stay with us, that still continues to pay out commissions. So considering a trailing structure, mm -hmm. I think um, is probably an important piece as well. Huge. And one important lesson that I learned early on in business development is it's a lot harder to keep a client than to go get one. And so there's a real difference between business development and account management. Account management is making sure that that client, and this is also a component of networking and following up and reaching out and keeping in touch. You need to not disappear. Just because I'm in a business development role and I'm not a CPA does not mean I go, here you go, <laughs> have fun with them. And I run right. away forever. No, I'm going to come in the fold whenever there's an event that makes sense for them. If there's an article that I saw posted about a client, if I want to host an event at my client's space, you need to maintain that relationship with them and trailing commissions help with that. If, if mm -hmm. I disappear from a client in the first year or two, they have no incentive to want to stay with me if I'm completely gone from the picture. Right. So trailing still is, I look at it like surprise checks, <laughs> um, but it's also just that added, like you, you did it. They, they, la they made it another year because we have so many clients that have stayed for 30 40, 20 years, they've been here forever. But yeah. if you go into any opportunity, knowing that it's a lot harder to keep a client happy than to go get one, 
those trailing commissions, even if they're smaller percentages, it's still a piece of the pie. It's still something. Right. Absolutely. All right. We ran just a skosh over, but I want to give you one second to just any final thoughts, any uh, anything you'd like to close out? When you are networking, the main points that I want to hone in on is you never know where a conversation will lead. You need to start networking early in your career and keep networking throughout your career. Be famous, be a connector, and deepen and connect with people that you genuinely enjoy working with. Life is just too short. And the beauty of this whole approach is you might get some new opportunities out of it if you haven't been implementing any of these before. And feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I literally said this, but <laughs> I'm here just to be a resource for anyone in the community, whether it's accounting or non-accounting related. So perfect. Emily, thanks a bunch. We appreciate your time. Everybody, we thank you for attending this web 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 um, Try that again. We appreciate you attending our webinar today. As Emily said, please feel free to connect with us on social media. You can reach out to either Emily or myself if you have any other additional questions or anything we can do to be a resource for you. Thanks again, everybody. We really appreciate it. We'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.